In this episode, I want to address an attack on the Bible leveled by cosmic skeptic Alex Connor and Dr. Joshua Bowen in a recent episode of their podcast where they say that Deuteronomy 21 is the worst form of slavery ever recorded in the Bible. And it deals with the chapter on how Israel took to themselves captive slaves from conquered countries. Now, before I show you the clip, you can know that I absolutely disagree with their assessment of what the text is saying. And they also leave out key details that contextualize the scenario they describe, which they purposefully leave out to make it seem like the relishment of evil that they conjure up in their discussion is an attribute of the Mosaic Code, when in reality, it is not an attribute of God's law or the Mosaic Code, but rather a characteristic of their imaginations. I have to say this because in the clip, they are really going to luxuriate as much as they can in an idea of oppressive slavery so as to try to portray God as immoral. But the reality is that the text of Scripture says nothing of the sort, and I'm going to prove this to the listener after the clip, but you first need to understand that the accusation and the problem first before you can address it so that even your most hostile accusers can know that you are honestly dealing with them to their intellectual satisfaction. It really is a shame that the church has abandoned God's commands because they have retreated and given the moral high ground to the atheistic community. And then they wonder why it is the church has so many people leaving the faith. It's because of videos like this one that I'm about to show you. The atheistic clips and skeptics like the ones I'm about to show you say things like this. Here's the clip. From the Lord's own mouth, uh, and this is Deuteronomy 21, verse, verses 10 onwards. When you go to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hands, and you take captives, if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her, you may take her as your wife. Bring her into your home and shave her head, trim her nails, and put aside the clothes she was wearing when captured. After she has lived in your house and mourned her father and mother for a full month, then you may go to be her. Uh, then you may go to her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. I mean, I don't see a, a, a way of reading this that can be that can be uh, reconciled with the attitude that I often see. In, in popular apologetics that we're not really talking about, you know, slavery here. We're talking about something like people entering into a voluntary work contract. No, this is, this is <laughs> captives of war yeah. who the captors find attractive, yeah. give them a month to mourn for the people who presumably were killed by their new husband, and now they're yours to keep. Yeah. Again, uh, the verse you mentioned earlier, just because I, I want to make sure that our listeners hear it, from the Bible itself, so they don't think you're distorting things. Uh, earlier, the, in Leviticus 25, verses 44 onwards, you'll, uh, sorry, sorry, Deuteronomy. Uh, 20, 10 to 14, yeah. Yeah, so the, we were talking earlier about Deuteronomy uh, chapter 20, verses 10 onwards. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. Again, it seems like make them an offer of peace. That sounds like a good thing, but it says here, if they accept and open their gates, all of the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. Some peace. If yeah. they refuse to make peace, which, you know, uh, how dare they? The topic of issuing slavery in their terms of peace was addressed in episode two of the series. Moving on. Yeah. As they engage and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all of the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves, and you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. Yeah, you may use the plunder, and of course, the plunder is referring to the livestock, you know, the uh, the the property, and of course, the women. And now, this I, is. Alex, this is precisely what we see in the the very often uh, dis discussed passage, Numbers 31. Yes. The topic of Numbers 31 is also addressed in my episode from the Warfare, Violence, and Biblical Law series. Um, and what people miss 
about this is the, the, the Christian apologists that they 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 have this way of sort of um, spinning this in a way that uh, and it makes me sad, frankly. Um, but numbers thirty one is that these these virgin women uh, are are they're not only taken, but they are numbered and counted along with the other livestock in the chapter. Uh, I think it's probably down in like I can't remember seventeen and eighteen somewhere around there, but um, it might be even further down than that. But it but it it says you know such and such number of sheep and such and such number of cattle and such such number of women, right? Like it it and they're divided out among the tribes. So um, this this is something that what I hear all the time. That makes me ill. And I remember Mike Winger, uh, if you're familiar with him, had a discussion yeah. with Skylar Fiction um, several years ago on this particular passage. And I think it's the last time he's spoken with him. Um, and and Mike, uh, it, it just blew my mind uh, because he's he's saying – Essentially, things like, well, yeah, like this is this is a protection for the woman. If that's what you get out of that passage, um, I don't know. It be, it betrays, it tips your hand, what cards you're holding, right? What your position is, um, because the scene that you're describing would be akin to if someone were to break into my house right now. And were to kill me, uh, and to kill Megan, and to set the house on fire, and to take my five children as as captives, right, and keep them in the basement in their house while the, this house burns down, and keep them there, um, and and but to feed them. Right. And to clothe them and to 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 give them homeschooling. Right. And to teach them to play the violin or what, whatever else we would say would certainly no apologist would come to the defense of the, the captor, the kidnapper and say, well, I mean, it was it was a protection for the kids to take them out of that burning building. Right. This was for their benefit. Um, but what was he supposed to do? Just leave them there to die? Well, I mean, like, I, again, sick flex, bro. You know, like th- this this isn't the flex that you think that it is. Um, this woman, uh, not that women had uh, consent, uh, you know, or gave consent in marriages. That wasn't really a thing. Um, but certainly this this woman is is not giving consent either directly or. Uh, uh, or, or even if you want to make the argument um, that she would would have wanted it, she would have wanted it under duress, in the same way that my kids would have wanted the guy to take them instead of letting them burn alive. Um, I'm, I, and I'll be quiet, but like I, I picture um, that movie uh, about um, uh, oh my gosh, that's so terrible the, the 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 Holocaust movie that's so famous. I can't remember the name. Um, uh, there are but a few I can, I can think of. Maybe Schindler's List. Schindler's the, List. That's it. And there's a there's a scene where uh, the women in the concentration camp are simply trying to not be shot in the morning, and so they like slap their cheeks to make them a little bit redder, you know, a little bit rosier, so they don't look so gaunt and so pale. Um, and when that guy comes by, that 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 you know, officer walks by and doesn't shoot them, you know, or if if he were to say, "Hey, come with me." Um, you're going to be my wife. Would they have wanted that instead of being shot by the next officer? Yeah, hell yeah, right? Uh, but does that mean that they consented to it? Of course not. Does that make it okay? Of course not. Um, and so the logic here, I think it just it just betrays that you're starting with your conclusion as an apologist. And you're saying this has to be okay. This has to be okay, and I have to make that okay. Now, I don't know what Mike Winger in particular has said, I, I haven't listened to that debate, at least I don't think so. I am familiar with him. But but we were talking earlier generally about this uh, approach to the to the problem specifically of female slavery, that this is somehow for the benefit of 
the woman, that this is for their protection. And like you say, this is uh, an absurdity. So in Numbers 31, the part of that chapter that talks about taking captives is a context which Deuteronomy 21 applies. I should say now that I am convinced the women taken as captives in Numbers 21 are not taken to become wives primarily, but were rather taken to become concubines, which I prove in my series on concubines, wives, and biblical law, because wives in marriage covenants were not slaves or captives. They were free women. And I should say that I go more in depth on that series concerning aspects of Deuteronomy 21, concerning concubinage. But for this episode, I want to focus in on the consent aspect of this law. Now, all of Josh Bowen's made-up scenario in comparison to movies like Schindler's List is purely his imagination. Because none of that at all is in the text. What he has done is completely skipped over the fact that Midian was targeting Israel for the purpose of destroying Israel. The war that was had between the two of those nations was a war that was started at Midian's decision and thus granted justification to Israel's actions and how they retaliated. Again, I speak of this in my warfare series, which you can look to for a more detailed analysis of Israel's war with Midian. But what he's doing by illustrating all of that, is coming up with a scenario based on his presumption, a faulty presumption, that women who became concubines from amongst the captives had no ability to give consent in the matter. And even if they did, it was a consent that he says was under duress, which is not a freely given consent. Now, where does Joshua Bowen get this idea? That women had no say in matters concerning who they became wives or concubines to? I'll tell you where he gets it. He got it from his own head. And it's something his own head pasted eisegetically onto the text in places where he didn't see it mentioned. But the Bible does speak of consent and how women made these types of decisions all the time. But Dr. Bowen didn't see it explicitly written about here in this particular section of Deuteronomy 21. So he therefore concludes it must not have been there at all. And thus... He's making an argument entirely from silence. Arguments from silence are, yet again, the Achilles heel of a lot of these atheistic biblical scholars. And this is just one more example of it. Let me just give a quick recap over the decisions that women had in these matters by first turning to where the law talks about it and then turning to how that law was lived out in the actions of Israelites. In Numbers 30, the law articulates that women are involved in the decision-making process concerning matters about who their hand would go to in marriage or in concubinage. It says in that chapter that when a woman makes a vow or an oath, her head is allowed to nullify her vow, the head being whoever the man is in her life that has authority, such as the husband, the father, her master, so forth. But if her head does not nullify that vow, her vow stands and is to be respected as her own. The chapter also says that if a woman does not have a head in her life, which would be the case of the woman captive taken in Deuteronomy 21, that her vow stands without anyone being able to nullify it. This decision-making process is seen being played out in the story of how Rebecca decided to become the wife of Isaac. Her father discussed matters with Eliezer, the slave of Isaac. And to make the final decision, Rebecca's father asked Rebecca what her desires were and for her to make the final decisions about if she would leave her hometown and be married to this man. We also see that in Exodus 21, as we've already covered, concubines were given the right to decide if they wanted to end their concubinal relationship based on how they were being treated by their master. If the master fails to provide the necessities of life to her, namely food, clothing, and shelter, that she would have the right to leave him. And we broached that topic a little bit in our last episode, but I want to make clear that if food, clothing, and shelter are the standards for her to make an informed decision, how much more are the standards for safety from physical violence or threats to her life? And the law of God recognizes this. Which is why in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomical law, 
There are commands to not return a slave to his or her master if that slave is trying to escape the master. This necessarily means that if the concubine taken from war wanted to leave the man who desired her and took her, all of these laws protect her decision to do that. And that doesn't mean she was free from punishment for the sins of the nation that she participated in and that she was captured from in war because women taken as captives in war could still be put to all kinds of labor work contracts in different areas of Israel society. But it does mean that she is free from any retaliation or legal punishment for her decision specifically to leave her master because if it was for reasons that were provided for in the law, she was morally right and legally protected. But even if she left for immoral reasons, her moral standing before God may be wrong, but there was no legal consequences on her for this decision. And her free will was respected in the matter. Let's look at the law. Deuteronomy 21 verse 14 says, If you have no delight in her, you shall let her go where she will. So if the woman does not want to have or continue a sexual relationship with this man, then he obviously is finding no delight in her. And the Bible says that he is to let her go wherever she wants. Now I know I will receive criticism from saying this because critics will say that that clause in Deuteronomy 21 is not speaking about the master not finding delight as a result of her leaving him but rather was for not finding delight in her for some other reason while she was still living with him under his roof. And I agree that reasons for his being displeased with the concubine are found in scenarios where she was living under his roof. But there is no argument a critic can make to say that the woman refusing him and leaving him does not also fall under this category of actions that would be displeasing to him. And because of this, the law says he's to let her go and not try to force her to stay or even to make money off of her from selling her. We see in Leviticus chapter 19 how even when a female slave, a concubine, is behaving in a very immoral manner, even up to cheating on her designated man by sleeping with someone else, that her sin is observed and a spiritual guilt offering and ritual is prescribed, but no judicial punishment is physically leveled against her in that passage because she was not a free woman like a wife would be, because she was a concubine, a female slave, requiring any legal consequences that otherwise might be against her for her immorality to be drastically abated. There is no part of the law of God that commands nor protects any practice of forcing any woman into a sexual relationship against her will or consent. And Alex O'Connor knows this because if there ever was such a command in the Bible from God to do such a thing, he would have quoted it. But he can't quote one because there is none, which is why whenever he tries to portray the Bible— as if it does command or protect such a wicked thing, he ends up telling his listeners to just imagine that the Bible does. Imagine. A.K.A. it's, it's all in his imagination. The, the Midianites and essentially committing yeah. a, a genocide against the, the Midianites. And Moses instructs his, his um, combatants, Now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Now, I'm not entirely sure what... Uh, a bunch of aggressive males could want with a bunch of virgin girls. I'll leave that up to the imagination of the audience. I'll leave that up to the imagination of the audience. I'll leave that up to the imagination of the audience. Even in that scenario, the law observes and respects the agency and actions of the female slave concubine regarding her sexual relationship. This is not only proven in the laws which I just spoke to you about, but it's also seen being acted out in the day-to-day -day life of Israel. In the story of Judges 19, the Bible says that a Levite had a concubine from the hill country of Ephraim. Verse 2 of Judges 19 says that his concubine became angry with him and or became rebellious against him and went away from him to her father's house. Now in this story, 
she refuses her master and runs away from him. And the most reliable manuscripts of the story record her actions of running away from her master as being an act of unfaithfulness and immoral rebellion. Meaning that her reasons for running away were not lawful and were immoral. With that being the context, how did the authority figures in this concubine's life treat her? Did they force her to to do anything against her will? Was she under duress to agree to stay with her master? No, not at all. The story shows that after four months had passed, the Levite then decides to visit her at her father's house in an effort not to force her back, but to woo her back. Dr. Joshua Bowen and Alex O'Connor would have you believe that concubines had no free will or agency in such a scenario. But the Bible here says the complete opposite. It says in verse 3 that he, quote, arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. The entire scene plays out where the two authority figures in this concubine's life namely her master and her father, never force her against her will to return to her role as a concubine, but rather appeal to her, appeal to her volitional will without overriding it. AKA, they respected her decision in the matter. They spent days at the father's house in revelry and enjoyment of each other's company until the concubine finally decided to leave with her master after that long stay. They spent days at the father's house doing that. And this story is not one of forcing any woman against her will to stay in her concubinal status. And in fact, whenever the concubine is forced against her will later on in the story, it's considered a major sin, which justified not only the death of the perpetrators, but the death death to all the town that the perpetrators were from because Israel with God's endorsement, saw fit to punish the entire town for even allowing such a culture to exist amongst themselves where the behavior of forcing a concubine against her will was even an idea that was entertained. Because in this story, the concubine is raped to death by the Benjamites. And so God called for the punishment and the bloodshed of the Benjamites for doing such a thing. But notice that the scandal surrounding the concubine in this matter is only associated with forcing her against her will. There is no scandal at all associated with appealing to the will, with appealing to her mind, with appealing to her agency as a concubine in the first half of the story. And the way she's treated in that part is perfectly in line with the laws of the Bible that I just showed you about how women were part of the decision-making process on what man they went to or what man they decided to stay with. I had one hostile critic I was uh, squabbling with on this matter get upset at me for pointing this out. His response was that in Judges 19, the respect given to the concubine and her agency in the first half of the story was merely an, an example of the Israelites just not following the law which he said is just common because there were tons of times when the Israelites didn't follow the law. And so I had to ask him, what exactly, what law were they in violation of when they respected the concubine's will? And of course, he could not come up with one. And in fact, his entire approach to the Bible was one where he just assumed it must be the case where women's decisions as concubines were just not respected because that's just what he's been told and it definitely makes it easier for him to just straw man the Bible and portray it as evil so that he can think of himself as having higher moral standards when the truth is he basically just maligned unjustifiably the Bible and accused it of saying things not only that it does not say but that are complete opposite of what it says. So all in all, When Israel went to war to punish a nation for its wickedness, a woman taken in captivity had the opportunity to live under the roof of a soldier as his concubine. And she was afforded rights to mourn her losses and adjust to that societal change. And if she decided she didn't want to have a sexual relationship with this man, Deuteronomy 21, Numbers 30, Exodus 21, and Judges 19 prove that this concubine could leave on her own decision 
without any kind of legal punishment or physical force laid on her, even if her reasons for leaving were immoral. The way the laws were written and the way they were carried out in the life of Israel show that Dr. Joshua Bowen's twisted fantasy against the Bible is a made-up straw man used for shock value to distract away from the laws of God that apply to this scenario and uh, show that justice and goodness is protected and promoted in such scenarios from God himself. It's too bad the majority of Christian leaders are not touching these verses, not even with a 10-foot pole. And even the ones that do, only do so glossingly, so as to skip over them as fast as they can. Most Christian leaders are just not facing head-on what the actual texts of Scripture are plainly saying. And most hostile skeptics are getting carried away by projecting things onto the Bible, things that are not there at all. I hope the listener will appreciate not only how I have accepted the plain meaning of these texts, but that I have also carefully handled the texts so as not to add anything either that isn't already there in Scripture. I encourage the listener to study these texts on their own, to make right in their mind the truths that I've just presented from this video. And even if the listener thinks I did not exegete fairly what is in these particular Bible verses, I think the listener can at least agree that I've opened a door to understanding these texts in a much more fair manner than how the atheists and skeptics have been exegeting them this whole time.